Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Alex Lopez Talks on the Alex Lopez Rocks YouTube channel. Joining me today is the awesome Simon Tam. Simon is not only the founder of the Slants organization, uh, it's a wonderful nonprofit group that he's going to explain a little more about, but he's also one of the founders of the Slants, this awesome band that you guys have got to check out. I will have some links to the to his YouTube channel and the videos in the description below. Simon, thank you for joining us, man. Thank you so much for having me. Oh man, this is fantastic because it's like, I, I, I actually met Simon through CD Bay because they were doing their annual conference. Uh, it was either last, it was last year because of the uh, pandemic and they did it all virtual and you were one of the, uh, speakers and one of the chairs, one of the core people that a lot of people were going towards because um, of the way your band kind of got a little bit of success. You guys were doing like comic cons and all these awesome d different ways to play out. It, it blew my mind. I'm like, how did he get to do that? Like, I mean, it was like, I was blown away by that. And I was from there, I went and started checking out the music and learning a little bit about uh, your foundation as well. So, and, and a lot of the civil rights advocacy that you've been doing. Yeah, this uh, seems like so long ago when we were doing oh. the DIY musician con, but <laughs> yeah, you know, it was definitely a really fun experience. And I've been speaking there for a few years now, but uh, every time I really enjoy it because it's just such a great opportunity to meet other musicians and artists and to share a little bit about our experiences so that hopefully people can level up their careers. Yeah. And it's funny that you said level up because that's actually one of my uh, favorite songs that you guys play. I think you did that on purpose. It was a nice little slip in there. <laughs> um, so what, what got you into uh, music? Like what, what were your, some of your influences growing up that kind of shifted in that direction? I think for as long as I could remember, music was always on the radar. Like my parents have these home videos of me when I think I was about three or four years old. I would grab my dad's acoustic guitar, jump up on the coffee table and start pretending to play a show. I'd like scream and just hit this guitar. I think something in me just knew that this was what I wanted to do. And since I grew up in the early 80s, I was definitely shaped by a lot of the music coming out then. So a lot of the new wave bands awesome. uh, like New Order and Depeche Mode were, were certainly huge. But my dad also had a pretty decent record collection of the Stones and the Beatles. So I kind of cut my teeth on rock and roll as well. And then as I got older, uh, probably about seventh, eighth grade, I discovered punk rock and never looked back. <laughs> so oh, that is so it, awesome. You know, definitely Ramones and Ramones inspired bands, which are, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. But that was the kind of stuff I kind of bounced around between. And nowadays I love just about every type of music and I try and find something that I enjoy in, in nearly everything, whether it's the storytelling of a certain genre or just really good beats and instrumentation. That's awesome. Now, what was the... Um inspiration for the slants well the slants are really kind of a cross between that early 80s new wave sound so duran duran depeche mode the cure a band sort of like that mixed with a little bit of this kind of punk edge and i think as different members came and went over the years they certainly brought their own influences in but we really yeah. want to strike that balance you know, kind yeah. of like the killers before they started to sound like Bruce Springsteen, just really kind of a lot of synths and keyboards and some kind of moody, dancey kind of rock and roll. And that's what I was going to say. I remember I, the, the two songs that definitely stuck out to me the most were definitely Misery and um, which like well, the first time I heard that, I'm like, it, it, it was like a little bit of everything, but in, in the most amazing way, because you had like a little bit of like the new wave with like uh, had like a Duran Duran like vibe to it and like almost a baseline of that mixed in with like a little bit of pop punk then a little bit of aggressive like Ramones feel and then like a little like twist on top of like the killers and I was like, that is insane and I love it and then the music video itself was so good. But thank you. That that was a uh, probably one of my favorite experiences to shoot, actually. And we we actually shot two music videos that same day. So 
Misery was shot the same day as another video uh, for a song called Sour Love. They were actually in the same location. It was oh, an wow. abandoned electric power plant that was out in Oregon that we, I just somehow convinced them to let me film there. And we had to run the, uh, the whole place, but they, each location looked totally unique. And we just were like, we have to have it all. And since we're here, we might as well shoot another video. So we quickly set up like oh, wow. a PA system blasted the music and then just kind of played around with it and then had two very different looking videos even though uh it was the same place now yeah because uh on misery you guys did this like had like film footage from a movie as well yeah we were collaborating with a steampunk martial arts movie called tai chi zero they were originally going to shoot it as a trilogy so we were doing a video and song per film and we were going to box it together in like this dvd set the third movie never got green lit so we ended up just doing this collaboration for the first two and that's kind of how we got early access to the film footage which i was just super excited about because it was all choreographed by Samuel Hung, who did like everything from the bulk of my favorite Jackie Chan films to The Matrix. And so to have that kind of action choreography spliced in with our video was just such an honor to, to be a part of. It, it was so cool. I was like, this music video is amazing. <laughs> like I was so blown away from it. Like you had like a little bit of The Matrix stuff, a little bit of like a little bit of, it felt like a little bit of Hidden Tiger Crouching Dragon or and and then your music video blended in with it so perfectly i was like did they film it like consecutively with like this with the with the movie people or what and it, it because it was just like it was so tied together tied together yeah, so we, well we had an idea of what the movie was going to look like we actually didn't receive the footage yet they just we just kind of knew the themes and then we when we were walking through this power plant i saw this room with this giant like boiler in the back of it and i thought hey this would be perfect we'll just basically play a show in front of this boiler and we our band actually used to tour with fog machines so we had someone behind us like lighting up fog throughout the the you know us playing this thing oh, so wow. it would look like the the boiler was on and that's how we kind of fused it with the the steampunk uh, martial arts film because they had a lot of steam and explosions and things like that so when we when we actually got the footage the director just kind of tried to color correct to make it match and make it seem like it was the same era or same kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. That's that's so amazing. And you guys did this, I, only place I've seen where it's like, where they did the music video in its entirety in an arcade with Level Up. That was so cool too. Well, tell me a little bit about that video. Well, the song we wrote already had kind of this like 16 bit vibe, like retro arcade feel. And the song, when we imagined the, the lyrics, we kind of imagined like, okay, what would a first date be like? And we kind of have these video game uh, ideas. So I thought, why not film this thing in an actual arcade? And we just, there was a few of them in Portland, but one of them actually had a Tesla machine. So I was like, we got to use this thing. It was a place called Quarter World. We just nice. called them up and said, hey, can we just rent out this arcade for the day and just fill it with people? And they're really kind to work with us on this. We just got a bunch of extras and we were like, all we need you to do is just play free video games all day. Like we got credits that the arcade gave us. So if awesome. people could actually play the games. They weren't just like pretending to play. So they yeah. weren't bored. And we just kind of filmed this first date kind of at the arcade where people were kind of choreographed their own dance. We had two dancers that were just absolutely incredible, who had great chemistry. And our band just basically made like a small cameo in it. Like we're in the background playing games and that kind of thing. And yeah. for the full version, we decided to just kind of goof around and have like this kind of dance break off kind of thing. Yeah. And it was like, I, I thought that was really cool. Like the way it all kind of just went together, you know, it was like, like the song and the video, like were perfect. Like it were like a perfect marriage. Like it's the visual of what you, you're hearing and vice versa. That, that's definitely what we tried to do. And the video was actually directed by our guitarist who dabbles in film on the side when he's not in, you know, doing music. So awesome. it was really nice to have someone who's intricately involved with the music side, but also understood what we we're trying to go for on the visual side. And yeah. actually that week we had some friends of ours who, who were also in the film scene and they let us borrow a crane. So we got these cool overhead shots which made it kind of feel like an old Nintendo game with the That's main so character cool. walking in. And we wanted to give it that Zelda-like vibe. 
I love it. Yeah, you could like I was thinking Frogger, but Zelda was probably more real, was more probably to the point. <laughs> well, you know, we actually had Frogger in the background too. <laughs> yeah, that's why so I was like, oh wow, that's that's amazing. You, there was one more that I really enjoyed, and I I brought it, I pulled it up just so I could remember the title to make sure I got it right. Let the right one in, where it's like if you've got like the uh, the old fashioned sushi line coming out from the in the in the uh, restaurant. Yeah, that was just kind of a fun idea because I used to go to these sushi conveyor belt restaurants and thought, what if we just like threw a camera on there? And so again, we called up a local sushi restaurant that had one that I thought the background could work with us. Then we just got a bunch of extras and we just kind of gave everybody their own little storyline. Say, okay, imagine this is what's playing out and just kind of do this as the camera's walking by. We we did, or rolling by on the belt itself. We did three takes and we just picked one of them that we liked the best. It was, it was really good. Like I, I found it like, it was like really amusing because it's like, it seems like you were kind of also capturing like the different personalities in the band as it was going because you guys each kind of played your own little role. You were reading a book and then like, I think it was your lead singer was kind of like having a drink and shaking hands with another member that with a couple of other people there. And then another ba band member was off to the corner. Oh, yeah. And it was just a lot of friends of ours as well. A lot of local Portland musicians or artists, activists that are kind of cameoed in that video. And in fact, a couple of the people at the counter actually ended up being in the video for Level Up and ended up dancing in, in that video. Oh, wonderful. And um, you, you were talking about activism. Um, I'd love to kind of have an opportunity for us to kind of promote and draw some attention to, to what you've been working on with the slants organization as well. Um, it's a, I want, I'm going to let you explain it just because I think it, it's going to sound better coming from you than from me. Sure. So <laughs> in 2019, our band actually decided to retire from live touring, not knowing that there was this global pandemic coming that would shut down shows for a minute, <laughs> but we decided we wanted to use our resources and use our platform to really bring more attention to causes that we cared about. We were already kind of in incorporating activism with our music anyway, but we thought, hey, let's just double down. We'll start our own nonprofit. And so we started raising money to give to other Asian American artists who were kind of coming up, uh, not just musicians, but theaters, films, uh, dancers. I, I mean, every kind of medium where we thought there's some really interesting play between their own activism and their art, we wanted to fund that. And then as 2020 rolled out, we kind of pivoted a little bit because we saw as the world was closing down, you know, everyone talked about saving all these businesses, but there was so little being saved for performers and artists and people who gave meaning to those trying to make sense of the world as there was all this chaos and uncertainty. So we saw this decline in support for the arts at the same time, this unprecedented rise in anti-Asian racism. So we said, mm -hmm. you know what, let's turn our focus on this. We'll fund artists who are trying to create engaging conversations, trying to share stories about like why we need to talk about these issues. And so we started doing a, a lot of that. And nowadays we are continuing to fund ideas, but really we're trying to think of things like how to speak to larger issues. And so it, we combine a lot of like funding with mentorship. We're trying to make sure that artists who are in this have some kind of sustainable career, that they can uh, build up their careers in a way that can continue to bring returns and expand their audiences so that they aren't just kind of re relying on say live touring or even an arts grant that gives them a bit of funding for a minute. We want to teach them how to really take control of their careers in a way that can change the culture and make a much bigger difference. See, I love that. That's for me. It's not just like you guys have a great sound musically, but what you guys do outside of the music and what you do with you, your ability to influence is just as important. And I love that you guys decided to basically band together and say, you know what, we're not going to play out as much or for a while, take a break, and we're going to focus our attention on bringing the attention to an entire cultural problem that's currently existing, not only just with your with the Asian community, but within the arts itself. And you also recently started CPOC Music. That's right. We wanted to launch a new music business conference that's developed specifically for artists of color. I, you know, I think too often we go to these major music business. Mm -hmm conferences, music industry uh, festivals, and that sort of thing. And while they're 
you know, a lot of times they have some good information and it's relevant. I just kept getting frustrated because they all talked about wanting to be more inclusive. Yet when it came to their lineup of speakers, it oftentimes wasn't nearly as diverse that I, as I would hope it to be. And then when they talk about trying to make things accessible or wanting to do things for artists, half the time you go and watch these people present and it's either not relevant at all because I mean, let's face it, the, the social oh, media manager for Lady Gaga or Justin Bieber, they, they're going to talk about having million dollar budgets and that's not relevant for indie artists. Or mm -hmm. it, the other kind of side of the pendulum is that oftentimes it's a speaker who's too busy selling their DVD sets or consultation and say, hey, buy my book. And you get very, very little content that's actually applicable. So we said, let's just wipe this away and imagine something from the like if we could design it with equity from the very very beginning and make it specifically for people who traditionally don't get that kind of attention or mentorship or opportunities what would that look like so that's what cpoc music was kind of birthed out of i see i love that because i think you're you kind of hit it right on the head when there's these big music conferences not um you there's usually like the up-and-comers who don't know how to get their foot in the door and then you know being you know, in a minority or kind of thing, it's like you're like you're saying, it's it gives the impression of being inclusive, but there's really nobody you relate to. And usually when somebody's already made it, they've already they sometimes lose touch of how how it took them to get there, you know? Absolutely. And I think it's also really important for us like to build multiracial uh, coalitions. Like, it, it's great to be hanging out with your own, like, affiliation. Like, for me, I spend a lot of time in the Asian American community, and I get a lot of rewarding experiences from that. But I think it's also really important to say, hey, how can we build allyship? How can we work with other people? Because a lot of times, they struggle with very similar things, where they kind of have these parallel experiences when it comes to systemic or institutionalized forms of discrimination. So why not work together? Why not build new alliances and friendships along the way? And I think this is a really great opportunity to do that. It absolutely is. I mean, that is amazing. Like for me, it's like great music, uh, awesome charitable organization, and then creating an opportunity for people who probably wouldn't have that opportunity before to showcase themselves a little more and, and be part of a, a larger community. Yeah, I, I think nearly everything that I'm doing these days, it's because I want to be for this next generation of musicians, what I wish I had when I was coming up. Like, I wish I just had someone I could talk to. I, I think there's a lot of great information out there online and, and books and that sort of thing. But there was also a whole culture of people who kind of prey upon artists and musicians. Yeah. They're like, oh, you want some advice? You got to pay for it. You got to pay to play. And I'm like, I'm not about that. I, I think yeah. we should kind of democratize things a, a little bit, make things easier because we all benefit when artists do well. We, we all benefit when people have access to information that allows them to fully express themselves and bring themselves to their art, right? whether it's music or books or otherwise. And so the more that I can help the arts flourish, and for me as a musician, like I'm all about the music part of things, but you know, I, I certainly enjoy other forms of art. Oh, the more yeah, I can right. kind of urge that forward, particularly from like cultures that are traditionally uh, represented in, in the marketplace, the more that I'm gonna enjoy my life because I get to see all these incredible music uh, or musicians. I get to see incredible films, and theater productions, and it's just really exciting to be a part of that. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And just like, look for, because of how we met, I met you through, like I said, CD baby. And one of the things I know you had a full plate. And one of the things you were saying is like, I'm not, I don't, I'm not seeking any kind of financial payment. If you want to donate to my charitable organization, I'd gladly accept that, but I'm not looking to make a buck off of anybody. So when I reached out to you, I was like, that is, that's a sincere and genuine guy where he's, He's not, he, a lot of people, like you would say, are very predatory. They usually like, well, I'm going to need this amount of X amount of money before I even listen to anything or X amount of money before I give out any advice. And your mentality was like, yeah, let's schedule something out. I've, you know, when we both have time to do it. And, you know, if you don't mind, I'd appreciate maybe donating if you donate to this charity organization that I'm running. And I was like, that's awesome. You know, I immediately, I was like, let's do this. And I, you know, and I got some good advice from you and, 
you know, I, I donated to the slants organization that, that day. And it was, it was awesome. Yeah. And thank you for that. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I do think that people should be compensated for their labor. Oh, absolutely. I just don't like it when people make that its main criteria or they're driven solely by it. And yeah. so I can't find a balance. I mean, I'm at a place in my life now where I don't need to do consultation for a living. So I'm like, hey, this could be a great fundraiser for, for stuff that I care about or just to try and get other people engaged in philanthropy, like people who yeah. maybe aren't used to giving or supporting organizations. It's an opportunity to see like, hey, what, what happens when you invest in the arts or in something that you, you care about? Yeah, and I think and I think you kind of nailed it on the head too because you're you're adding value to something. So that means it's if you if you give it away for free completely, there's the value people won't appreciate it. I'm not saying it in a negative way where people won't appreciate it. It's just because they think, well, oh, it's free, so I can handle it any time, or I'll get there, or I won't do something. Versus if you're incentivized to put a little bit of yourself into something, it brings the value up on on what you're investing in, and also helps you raise yourself a little bit. Yeah, I think some people say you got to have a little skin in the game or something like Ex that. Exactly, exactly. Now, you like um, going back to a little bit of music, because I know you're not as active as you used to be. You're kind of taking a step back in bees and are focused more on, you know, CPOC and the Slants organization. Um, but when you were playing out, what was that holy grail piece of gear and were you able to achieve in getting it? Holy girl, piece of gear. I, I mean, it really just kind of depends, but I would say probably the favorite thing that I acquired uh, during my last tour was a Reverend Thundergun bass. I just have it collected a lot of uh, bass guitars over the years. Yeah. But this one was just, I just loved it. I, I, I mean, I play it all the time, even to this day, just because it just had such an incredible sound. It was really light, great, great to move with, and really versatile. So that's probably been my go-to thing. And then the the other thing uh, that Dunlop makes is a their own version of like a sans amp for they call it a bass DI. Mm -hmm. I loved the sound of this thing so much that oftentimes I wouldn't even bother unpacking my bass rig or amp. I would just use this interface and go right into the house, and I'm like, oh wow, good. So. Yeah, yeah, I just go right into the pay system and it just already sounded amazing. So I was like, I don't need to break my back like hauling out an eight by ten cab anymore. <laughs> just yeah. the thing that's already in the base case. Well, and and the base amp heads are crazy heavy too. So not it's not just the it's not just like the massive subwoofers that you're carrying up the stairs to a show. It's also the the amp head and the base itself. So I just would like I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> So my, my gear awesome. kind of shrunk down over the years, but yeah. that was one of the things that where I could still get a really uh, full sounding uh, bass sound that had a lot of presence that, you know, I could dial it in. So it kind of cut through and get, didn't get muddled up with the synth bass that we had running in our backing tracks. Mm -hmm. it, it just allowed me to have the right kind of sound without worrying about it. And a lot of times I would go to shows and other bass players would be like, wow, you have such great tone. Where's your amp? I didn't see it on stage. Did you have it behind the stage? And I was like, no, I just have this little box. This is all I need. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I want to find something like that for the guitar. <laughs> I, I think guitar is a little more unique in that you got to have like air moving. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I haven't found anything like that in the guitar yet. Although yeah. I do use a, a Fender Mustang like modeling amp and I've been really blown away about like by how good it sounds when you kind of line out, like it still sounds pretty good. I mean, not, it's not as good as, you know, live and yeah. in my opinion, like tube driven amps, but it oh, yeah. sounds pretty good and if you're not a musician you probably won't be able to tell the difference anyway okay that's see that that's something i might have to investigate then it's, um, it's definitely worth your while it's it's probably one of the best valued amps i've seen like for a few hundred bucks it sounds like really really great nice. and you can hook it up with a app on your phone and just really dial in your sound or like save a lot of different sounds so I, I keep one right here next to me and oh that's awesome and i record a lot of the early guitar tracks directly into my interface with that amp and just you know before even going to the studio i just say like hey i want something in this ballpark range and it usually sounds quite good nice nice that is so like for me that's like that's 
always been what something how do we simplify it without taking away from the integrity of the sound you know so yeah that's, that's really cool no need to tour the giant rack anymore <laughs> Nice. Now, one thing, uh, just to get back on to the Slants organization um, and the foundation that you guys have got, you guys are actually, you guys are, four, it's, I think it's called a 403B, right? Oh, 501C3. 501C3. So, 501 so that means you guys are actually registered as a legitimate nonprofit. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. anybody who contributes, it's, it's fully tax deductible. Nice. And for, by the way, for anybody who's uh, curious and interested, um, if you go on Amazon Smile, uh, Smile, they're actually one of the, the Slants uh, Foundation is actually one of the uh, charitable nonprofits that you can donate to via purchases as well. So I know some people might have an issue with, you know, the Amazon concept, but they actually do have options where every dollar you spend, a, sm a portion of that is going to a 503C nonprofit. Correct. Yeah. As long as you start your shopping at smile.amazon.com, they do a percentage. It's not very big. <laughs> it's like okay. one to three percent of the profits of an item. But yeah. you know, every single cent counts. And so for anyone who yeah. chooses to name our nonprofit as a recipient of that, we we definitely appreciate it. That's awesome. Well well, Simon, is there anything you'd want to um uh, plug and promote and where can everyone find you if for those who are interested in our band's work you can go to the slants.com and if you're interested in the slants foundation and want to know more about the support that we offer to artists you can go to the slants.org i don't really have anything to plug or promote but you know if people check out the music or the, the activist stuff that we're doing i'm always deeply appreciative of that and of course if anyone uh, wants a chat i i do have a, a music business podcast called music business hacks and i think i'm nearly at 500 episodes or so oh wow so, <laughs> and i go in and kind of dish out uh, free advice and there's plenty of content there so for folks who are wanting to understand yeah. more about uh, how i kind of navigate the music industry uh, I, I i pretty much lay it all out there that's awesome. And 500 episodes, you're going to pick up something. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty there. I've, yeah. I've been really fortunate to interview a lot of really incredible folks in the industry as well. Nice. But we try and make it as applicable as possible. So every episode's usually kind of about 10, 15 minutes. And I provide like a step-by-step -step instructions on how to like deconstruct that concept, whether it's booking a tour, uh, negotiating a record label deal, sync licensing, whatever it might be. I just try and like detail out, here's how to get more information and here's how to actually develop that skill set. That's, that's amazing. I, I love that. And by the way, folks, the links to everything Simon just mentioned are going to be in the video description below. Definitely click, a, click on those links. Go to the slants.org and donate if you can. I know that um, every little bit counts and I know Simon will be grateful for it and so would I. Um, Simon, thank you so much for your time today, man. I really appreciate it. And um, this was a blast, man. I'm looking forward to when this episode airs. Thanks so much for having me. And hopefully we'll be able to meet up in uh, Texas again one day. That'll if, be great. Uh, the world returns to some state of normalcy. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I definitely hope to return to DIY Musician Con and hope to see you there. Definitely, man. Simon, thank you so much. And folks, thank you for tuning into this ep another episode of Alex Lopez Talks. You guys have been wonderful. Be light and love.